Let's continue with more reactor systems. So we saw this far the simplest thing, a CSTR, just a stirred tank reactor, good for slurries. And we saw the USB, the upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor, where we have an upflow and we get granular sludge. There are several variations nowadays available on the USB. A first one is the so-called expanded granular sludge bed reactor. And basically this is a USB that is taller and in which the velocity of the water going up is a lot larger. As I said in a USB, you have about one meter per hour of water coming up. In an EGSB you go up at six to 15 meters an hour. So it goes up faster and this gives you more mixing, more intensity, more uh, even distribution of material across the reactor. And that makes these systems more suitable if you have a wastewater that doesn't contain a lot of solids. Uh, and that is, for example, low in organics, even towards sewage. The good mixing allows you also to load more because you bring more food easily to the microorganisms. So you can load something like 30 kilograms of COD per cubic meter per day. So the advantages of this mixing in this structure is is it's good for cold wastewaters. A cold wastewater means that the kinetics is quite slow. So per unit reactor, I don't form a lot of methane, so I don't get a lot of gas bubbles. And the gas bubbles help you to mix everything. So if you don't have a lot of production because the wastewater is cold or the wastewater is dilute, just pumping the water faster through the reactor, you really introduce that mixing and then you still have a good performance. If there's toxic compounds, this mixing also helps a lot. You know, normally in a slow reactor, if something toxic comes in from the, from the bottom, it hits the first layer of microorganisms. But if this is an intensive reactor mixing very well, whatever is toxic is just distributed over the whole reactor. So toxic compounds of, or longer chain fatty acids that really come from fats, C16, C18 length molecules, they're better distributed, you have less issues. And these reactors also tend in certain cases to have less issues with foaming. The disadvantage, because I have such a high upflow velocity, small particles, small solids, they do come out of the reactor. And that leads to um, an effluent that may need, may need more post-treatment, depending on the conditions. A reactor that can solve that effluent uh, restriction of solids washing out, but comes with some more complexity, is the internal circulation reactor. And so this is a new hybrid reactor, well new, it exists about 15 years uh, to 20 years at the time that uh, we make this MOOC. Um, there's two stages in the reactor, so at two different places in the reactor you are going to collect biogas. You can load them quite highly, same level as EGSB, and they're good for uh, streams with low solids, both with high and low COD, and they're also very good to deal with calcium-rich streams. The upflow velocity is very high, 20 to 30 meter per hour. Let me explain to you now how this works. The next reactor type I'll be discussing is the internal circulation reactor. This is a reactor specifically developed by one company, Parks in the Netherlands. Typically these reactors are very tall and that makes them more expensive construction-wise. But because they're so tall, you have a number of advantages. For example, you have less issues with calcium scaling. So this reactor works in two phases. So we have and two locations in the reactor, a phase separator. Let's call it about halfway, a phase separator and quite to the top. So wastewater comes in from the bottom, again. And moves up at quite a high velocity this time. So there's a high shear. We again have our granular sludge just like in the USB, that stays here. Now we collect gas 
about halfway here in a central tube, a riser. And this, the fact that gas is coming into this reactor creates a so-called gas lift. With the gas lift I mean that because the average density here is lower than on the outside because of the presence of gas, water is being pulled up all the way to the top of the reactor. So we pull gas liquid as a mixture up to the top of the reactor where basically the water sprays out and the gas is separated. So as the water falls down again, it collects in a so-called downer tube. And so it's going to fall down because now we have lost the gas. So the water comes down at quite a velocity here. This is very ingenious. But what you see now is that this reactor is spontaneously going to circulate because of the gas formation. I don't need to invest energy for that part. Because of the high velocity and the high mixing, the quality would not be very good after one stage. So at the top of the reactor, we have our final phase separator to collect all the residual gas that is being formed in the second phase. And then we have our effluent. So it's a tall, intensive reactor that is spontaneously circulating because of this gas lift here very intensive, high-performance system. So the internal re circulation reactor is a tall, self-mixed intensive reactor. And this has certain specific advantages. Because it's tall, the high pressure in these 20, 30 meter high reactors limits the scaling. You basically keep calcium carbonates more in solution. So if you have a pulp and paper wastewater, you have less issues with scaling in the reactor. And you get a very high performance. You see conversions now over 30 kilograms of organics per cubic meter a day. That's more than 2 kilowatts of power per cubic meter of reactor. And that is a lot. The disadvantage is while you have a taller construction, so there's a cost. Um, and you may need some hydrolysis pre-acidification step. Although that's not specific for uh, internal circulation reactors, it can also occur for other systems. And a final one, which I want to draw, is the anaerobic membrane bioreactor. Sometimes the sludge that is formed uh, in your anaerobic digester does not form good aggregates. So it doesn't separate well. That can happen when there's, for example, quite some fats present. In other locations, the requirements for the effluent quality are very high. And so that would, with a normal anaerobic digester, create issues uh, towards the quality. And a solution for that is to introduce a membrane. So, typically, if we have an anaerobic membrane bioreactor then, we will introduce a membrane unit besides the reactor system. I'll draw it quite schematically here. In most cases, these are so-called cross-flow membranes, tubular membranes outside the reactor. And so water from the reactor, which can now be a normal mixed reactor, is brought to the membrane unit where we draw out effluent. The more concentrated water with sludge is then brought back to the reactor. So conceptually it's very simple. Eh? It's just a reactor coupled to a membrane unit to filter out the solids and retain them in the reactor. Obviously you can also waste the excess sludge here. The advantage of such a system is that you can achieve a very high effluent quality. You can even make sure that there's no bacteria in the effluent. The disadvantage is that you need to install membrane units, which is not cheap. And anaerobic sludge is quite sticky, let's call it. So as a result, you need to um, have quite a high velocity of the water through the membranes. So you lose most of the energy that is generated 
from the biogas into pumping here. But a very qualitative system that is getting a lot of traction worldwide. So the anaerobic membrane bioreactor is basically a digester where I have a membrane keeping the solids inside the reactor and just pulling out the effluent. What's an advantage? Well, I pull the water through a fine membrane, so I'm certain to get a good effluent quality. Bacteria are stopped by the membrane. So if I have a concern about pathogens, if I have concern about certain solids coming across, the membrane stops them. I can load it very highly. I'm not depending on settling because the membrane filters everything out and I can work very compact. The disadvantages, I think one of them is quite obvious. If I have to push all that wastewater through a membrane, that costs energy and that's of course an investment by itself, the membranes. Plus the membranes will also foul, they will become dirty in time, so I need to perform a regular cleaning. This is an image of uh, one of these anaerobic membrane bioreactor concepts by uh, Veolia. It's the memthane concept. And what you see on the right hand side is the anaerobic digester. And then the fluid from the anaerobic digester goes centrally to these brown horizontal tubes you see there. These are so-called cross-flow membranes. So the water from the digester flows through there at quite a high velocity. Clean water is pumped out, is pushed out to the outside and collected. That's the clean effluent and the concentrate goes back into the reactor. In this final table, you see the different technologies compared with one each other. I did not explain the anaerobic filter and the anaerobic baffled reactor. That's outside the scope here, but I left them in for completeness. But you can see a CSTR, a USB, an EGSB, an IC and an ANMBR. They each have either an upflow or a downflow configuration. Depending on the technology, you have a different organic loading rate. So some can take a higher loading rate than others. But the more intensive the process is, there's always a price tag associated with that.